Um, you want to buy... You want to buy five cows. And then you guys are going to escort them down to the next town. We're going to try and sell them. Okay. Right. What type of profit are you going to... Well, the cow costs... How much does a cow cost? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. All right. A cow costs eight gold pieces. Okay. And you're taking 10 cows down to the city down there. And it's 180 miles away. Okay. That could be a, could, could be a fun adventure. I mean, the cowboys did it for, for, for 100 years. And, you know, they had adventures and stuff. Okay. We can do cows. Um, how much do you make when you get there? Well, eight gold. Because that's what you buy a cow for in the PHB. Uh you, you want to make a profit on it. Oh, you're going to haggle. Okay, yes, roll. Okay, fine. You haggled, you win. You get... Um, nine gold. You get nine gold, I, I think. I don't know. Ten? You happy with ten? One of the cows is sickly, probably. Ten? Ten? All right, fine. Fifty gold a cow. Jeez. No, 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 no. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Campaign Creator Series. My name is Guy and today's episode is brought to you by World Anvil. WorldAnvil.com, the aggregator of worlds. You can get 25% off if you sign up for their Grandmaster Series. Uh, just uh, look down below, there's a link, follow it along and you can go and join World Anvil. Now, we're talking currency and trade. Currency and trade. How much, for how much, and how much can I sell it for, and how much are you willing to buy it for, and how much can I make off of the sale because you wanted it that much and I didn't want it very much at all? All of those kinds of wonderful questions plague us from time to time. Not very often, but they do crop up, and sometimes it's useful to know ahead of time how it works. Now, currency and trade are two very separate things, and we could have two separate videos, but I don't think that we need to because trade... Oh, Trade is not something that you're likely to come across very often, so you don't have to be too aware of it. To work it out beforehand, however, does alleviate some of the stress and pain that you might suffer if you don't have it on hand when your PCs start to trade. Currency, of course, is going to be used all the time. It comes as treasure, it comes as rewards, it's all kinds of wonderful things. So, how do we do it? What do we do? We're going to look at mixed or not. Do we mix our currencies? Do we not mix our currencies? What's the level of detail that we need to go into? Do we need to work out every single little microeconomic transaction within our giant, vast, empire-spanning, galactic empire? Do we? Do we really need to? And then what's a quick fix? I've got a quick fix. I know all the mathematicians out there are going to go, ah, No, that's terrible. We can't do that. That doesn't work. It's, it's evil. Sure, but it facilitates gameplay and it makes the experience that much more entertaining for everybody. And yes, if you want to work the system and come and make a fortune in one of my games, knock yourself out. It's imaginary money. Right, so let's jump into it. Mixed or not? Mixed currency or not? Now, in Dungeons & Dragons, there was the copper piece, the silver piece, the electrum piece, the gold piece, the platinum piece, celestial diamonds, uh, gold ingots, iron ingots, copper ingots, bronze ingots. Oh, good grief. Electrum pieces often fell away. Why? Because they were a weird currency. Copper piece, it was 10 copper pieces to one silver piece, 10 silver pieces to one gold piece, 5 electrum pieces to one gold piece, and then 10 gold pieces to one platinum piece. You see how electrum was just a little bit of a waste of time? So Electrum often gets dropped. It's very curious when you run old modules and the reward is 10 Electrum pieces. You said they're going 10 Electrum pieces. It's um, two, go two gold. Great. Why didn't you just give me 20 silver instead? So all of this stuff makes you sit back and wonder. Now when you're playing in a sci-fi game, usually it's whitewashed with credits. Everybody has credits or gold-pressed latinum, which never had a real fixed value. It was just as much as it needed to be per show. So is it worth having all of this stuff? The dwarves have got their own currency. The elves have got their own currency. And then the other elves have got their own currency. And then the below dwarves have got their own currency. Then the drugar have got their own currency. The drow have got their own currency. You open up your coin purse and it's filled with different currencies. 
Look at the trouble we have to go through here on Earth in the modern day age with computers and all kinds of calculations. When we arrive in a foreign country, we still walk up to the money exchanger and go, uh, can I take all of these bits and turn it into those bits that I can actually shop whilst I'm here? Even the advent of the credit card didn't really change the necessity for hold card filthy lucre. So we need to be aware of that. Do we need all of those levels of complexity? It can add a certain uniqueness. Oh, you've only got five shards. Well, I'm afraid we only accept crowns here and they've got to be royal crowns, not those pithy little imperial crowns. We don't take those here. Can get a little bit frustrating after a while. So what I would recommend instead is to do major levels. And by major levels, I'm talking about below, above, different environments. So on the Underdark, perhaps you have a single currency for the Underdark. I do, they're called shards, black obsidian shards. These shards are worth, one shard is worth 10 gold. The economy is just stronger in the Underdark because it's more dangerous and they have access to all of the rare, re <laughs> all of the rare resources and minerals that the surface likes to call gold and gemstones, so they're a stronger economy. My surface has crowns or gold pieces. It's as easy as that. So you've got your copper and you've got your silver because they're legacy. And then you've got your gold piece. I don't use electrum pieces. Platinum pieces I use occasionally, but they are all interchangeable. They're all usable. Shards, gold pieces. Then my aquatic environment. There we have shells. It's a simple term. It doesn't mean an actual cowrie shell, although that was used for currency on Earth many years ago. It just means shells. It's like a little clam-shaped disc, which is used and exchanged for currency. One shell is basically worth one gold piece. There's a bit of an overlap, so it's, it's close enough. Then if you go into the heavens or if you go into the hells, that's when you start to get a different form of currency, and that's souls. It's minted souls. Souls that have been compressed, desiccated discs, if you like. Souls that have been compressed down into, into a single, hard, very shiny substance. And one soul is worth quite easily a thousand gold pieces or a hundred shards depending on your approach. So that's what I've done. That's all it is. So if the players end up with a bag full of souls, shells, shards, and coins, gold pieces, I really should have discovered another S for that, shouldn't I? Gold pieces, that means they have been all over my world, in it, above it, around it, underneath it, and got wet in it as well. And that I think is then acceptable. So we need to make sure that it adds to our campaign world and that it doesn't detract from our campaign world. This detracts a little bit when the players are starting to get frustrated by all of the currencies. Having currencies for different areas, I think, makes those areas feel a little bit more unique and gives it flavor. It adds to it. It doesn't detract it. Those are my thoughts anyway. So when we then start to look at trade, so we've got currency, we've worked out our coinage system, we go, okay, cool, it's this, it's that, it's banana leaves, or it's porcupine quills, it doesn't really matter. We've worked it all down. Do we then need to go into an economic breakdown? Do we need to do a breakdown? Do we need to figure out the origins of this economy? Oh, do we need it? Do we really need it? What is the value to the PCs? What is the likelihood of them needing it really what is the what is the, the 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 value of that and i'm going to give you an example i'm currently running the campaign ghosts of salt marsh in it the characters have access to a ship a ship has the capacity to haul 100 tons of cargo from anywhere to anywhere else over water the potential for trade is therefore quite big, and in my experience, having run the adventures of the Windswift, where the crew again had an airship this time, but they could still transport cargo, the questions start to get raised. Well, how much money do I make for transporting one ton of wheat, one ton of rice? What does a passenger cost? So that's when you go, well, they are going to need that information, so I do need to prepare it. But how much do I need to prepare it? So I did an exercise, which you can do if you like. It was quite an interesting one. Now, this is using the Dungeons & Dragons system. So let's pop on over to that. You can see behind me now, I worked out 
What are the docking fees for a ship? Because that starts to form some basis around which we need to be reliably informed. So I said, all right, if this is the cost of a ship for a month, let's say, so it costs 50 gold pieces for a 100 foot long ship to dock for a month, that's not bad, or four gold per day, basically just dividing it out and bringing it down and then upping it slightly because it's a day rate. Okay, so I said, right, if that is our base, then let's see what does food and drink and ammunition cost on our ship. This is what it breaks down to 150 gold for 10 people based on the fact that it's about five silver per person per day. That's what you start to end up with. Okay, great. Then let's uh, look at that. So 300 sailors is 30 gold in terms of salary because they want 30 gold per month. Again, that value, this 30 gold per month, comes from the player's handbook. That's your basic average salary. So that means the ship's operating costs would be somewhere in the region of, per 10 crew, 450 individual uh, 450 gold pieces plus harborage, 500 gold pieces a month. Okay, interesting. Some of those numbers, like the harbor fees, I had to, I had to make up. Okay, the rest came directly from the book. Once you times it by ten or thirty or whatever the case might be. Now the weight of different things. I said, okay, well, food weighs one ton. Ten drink, ten barrels weigh one ton, etc., etc., etc. I then had to work out passenger costs. So in order to cover that five hundred cost. 10 passengers need to charge you need to charge them a certain amount so i started to go through all of that so here's your ticket nautical fare and basically then there's a modifier but it's on average 12 gold pieces per passenger so you've got to have a lot of passengers to make up your 500 gold but then let's go and look at cargo here is an example cargo we're working it out in ton so one ton is equal to 2000 pounds roughly the player's handbook only lists these things in pounds. One pound of wheat is worth such and such in the player's handbook. But you don't transport things in pounds. You transport them in tons. So I had to work out, okay, in tons, this is how much you get for a ton of wheat. 20 gold pieces. Wheat farmers, beware. Flour, that's where the business is. You get 40 gold pieces for flour. So the mill will buy the wheat from the farmer for 20 gold and will sell it for a whopping 20 gold profit. Yes, they have to have a windmill or a donkey and a grindstone. Salt is 100 gold pieces per ton. Iron, etc., etc., etc. It goes all the way up to rare spices at 30,000 gold pieces in rare spices. 30,000 gold pieces weighs 300 pounds. Carrying capacity of the average character, not 300 pounds. So there's one gigantic chest of gold pieces for one ton of spice. So we have to look at, okay, they're going to be paid in souls in my world. They're going to get given souls. That will allow us to give them 300 souls at least. And that's a bit better since souls have no weight while they weigh as much as a feather. So that means we're okay there. Okay, let's look at occupational space. How many passengers take up occupational space? And we worked that out. So this was a little bit of a thought experiment that I did. Once I had worked out all these numbers, I then tested it. So I said, right, a farmer could ship four ducks, three goats, two cows, and two riding horses on an average vessel for 200 gold pieces per week of sailing. It would cost the ship 160 gold in operational costs for the 10 additional passengers. That's the four ducks, two cows, three goats, and two riding horses. The captain of the ship nets at least 40 gold in profit. Ha ha! If he returns without cargo. The farmer sells everything for 323 gold pieces and four copper, making a profit of 123 gold pieces and four copper pieces. The pirates make a fortune if they hijack the ship and take everything at sea. The point that I was trying to make here was I was just working out, would it be valuable to be a farmer in this environment where these numbers are being drawn from the PHB? The answer is an emphatic yes. A ship's captain is going to struggle 40 gold pieces if he returns without cargo. So if he adds cargo in, he's going to make 80 gold pieces for a there and back trip as opposed to the farmer who has made 123 gold 
for a there. Although the farmer did spend two years raising the horses and the cows, etc., etc. So I went into a lot of depth there because there is a likelihood with my players having a ship that they are going to need that information. They're going to need to work out how much should the ship cost and what are the average transport fees and that sort of thing. So that gives us some insight into how far we need to go if it's likely to happen. At exactly the same time, if you're not planning on your characters having a ship or a wagon that allows them to transport in the ton range, you don't need to go there. You really don't. It's an interesting experiment to do once or twice, but not very often. So what is a quick fix? Let's say that my players decide that they are going to crew a ship. They're going to spend 500 gold and buy 20 tons worth of wheat. And they're going to transport it to another location. How do we work out how much profit they make? How do we take into account market volatility? How do we take into account supply versus demand? How do we take into account the player's guile at selling the object to the buyer how do we work out what the buyer's skill is and they don't get fleeced how do we oh, 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 oh. that starts to become a whole different type of role-playing game and unfortunately the major component there is a single player a single player is the one who's going to get excited about this kind of stuff maybe there's two of them but the other three or four are going to be going can we just kill the merchant and take his gold? It would be faster and easier than these freaking math calculations on supply and demand. So what I do is I have a very short hand. I take the distance covered divided by 10 plus the PC's persuasion barter roll versus the trader roll. So if the PC rolls 18 and the trader rolls a 10, the PC gets 8% on what they originally paid and if they transported it over let's say a hundred miles 100 divided by 100 is one so they're getting nine percent total profit if they brought it over a thousand miles that's a long journey that's a long voyage they're going to get 18 percent on whatever it is that they sold if on the other hand the pc rolls below the trader then the pc gets percentage minus so if they came in at less than 100 miles, and let's say the minus was minus 5%, then that is what they will make. They will make one, because it's 100 or less, divided by 100. They will make that 1% plus a negative value. So plus minus 5, they're making minus 4%. So they're making it at a loss. They can hold that cargo and move on. And what that represents is market volatility. It represents just uh, uh there's there's too much of that substance already here the quality is not very good there was some damage all of that kind of stuff it gets wrapped up into this little calculation and you're done now yes i know that there are players who are going to say but my persuasion test is so high i should be able to double the whatever no this is how the maths works because if you are making more than 20 percent profit off of your trips why would you bother being an adventurer? Why not just sail backwards and forwards? 20% profit, 20% profit, 20% profit, 20% profit. Bingo. What an absolute pleasure. And the whole point is the game isn't a trading game anyway. But we need to have these things in our game because it makes them more exciting. It makes them feel more like their real world. And if our players want to do so, then they certainly can. Another thing that will come up, and that's where this uh, quick fix calculation works out quite nicely, is my players have in the past set up a buyer-seller ship captain trade route where they've bought a ship, they've bought a crew, and they've bought a buyer at the two different ports, and that ship basically sails backwards and forwards, busy making the profit as and when it happens. As a result, the buyer's an NPC, the seller's an NPC. Should you really be rolling for it? No. I then just roll a d6, add that number to the distance covered, and that's the percentage profit that they make. Generally speaking, it will always be profitable unless I want it to not be for a narrative reason, in which case then I would say there's a complete loss here. The market is saturated with wool, my lord. We can no longer transport wool to the city. They are demanding timber. You will have to go on an adventure and find a timber supplier. And yes, I know it sounds like a very boring adventure until you realize that the timber that they're after is ironwood. And as everybody knows who's watched my videos, ironwood comes from a very, 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 very 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 dangerous undead tree that eats anything that comes near it by stabbing it with roots from the ground and reaching down with 
um, branches from the top. So to get ironwood is very difficult. The players would have to go in there and sort out the undead forest first before they could get to the actual ironwood. So there is an adventure waiting to happen. And I believe that whatever you add to your campaign, whether it's quick fixes or currencies and trades, it should always facilitate more interesting gameplay and create a living, breathing world. Until next time, light up the forge. I um I don't I don't like it. Um I'll give you three goblins, one cow. And half a ton of wool. And then you subscribe to receiving milk monthly from the farmer, plus half a donkey and eight cobbles. And then we've got a deal. Then we've got a deal. But if if the gobbles if the gobbles, which are goblin cobbled hybrids, if they arrive and they're ringing a bell, it means that there's something new happening and you should go and check that out uh, because I really didn't know how to finish off this video this week. I really didn't. I, I, I was. It's currency and trade. I mean, you've got to make it exciting. Otherwise, it's just boring, 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 boring. So half a donkey and half a cow, a conkey.